everybody uh, attending another IR session. Um, definitely appreciate it and appreciate everybody taking their time to speak with us. Today, I want to introduce you to Alexander. Alexander and I um, met each other a uh, year and a half ago uh, at Code on the Beach um, through a mutual friend, Sean. So big shout out to Sean. If he ever actually watches this, I know he couldn't attend this today, but hopefully he will. Um, but anyway, yeah, so previous speaker, Code on the Beach, um, definitely happy to have him. And he's, today he's going to be talking about MLOps. I'm very excited about it. So Alexander, take it away. All right. Well, let me share my screen. And uh, I think you're going to make my host first. Yep, I am right now. Perfect. And you are now the host. All right. Let me share my screen. Make sure we have computer sound as well, because we need it later. Perfect. And hopefully this is going to end up on the right screen. It did not. So we'll do that real quick here. Uh, view. This is always the thing. Which one is this going to end up on? There we go. You should probably see my slide now, right? Hope. If you don't see my main slide, that's yes. okay. Yeah, we see it. Perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you, Pete, for having me. Uh, so we're going to talk about something that is dear to my heart today, which is ML Ops. And I'm going to focus on it from a general perspective, but also then dive into MLOps in the .NET sphere, which is uh, where I'm focusing most of my time at. And uh, this is uh, something that I've been spending a lot of my time on the last half year or so ago. And I'm really excited to share kind of uh, my thoughts on this and this emerging um, part of the community. So uh, a little bit by myself first. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies, uh, although I focus a lot of my time on AI and ML as well. Um, but uh, I kind of cross cross uh, path there. Uh, I stream every Saturday on Twitch uh, at 10 a.m. and I focus mostly on contributing to open source when I stream. So I teach machine learning in .NET. I work together with a bunch of other people on a tool that I created in May called MLOps.NET, which focuses on supporting the machine learning lifecycle for the .NET ecosystem. So if you're interested in that and want to kind of tune in, learn more, contribute yourself, definitely tune in on uh, my Twitch channel uh, on Saturdays uh, or just check out the repo and we'll touch on that more later in this presentation. Uh, I'm also founder of the virtual ML.net conference. Uh, first event was in May of this year. It is a conference focused completely on ML.net, which is a Microsoft machine learning library um, that is written completely in C Sharp. We're going to have another event in, October, in November this year, uh, just after NetConf. It's going to be a hackathon where uh, everyone gets a chance to uh, uh, just kind of do their own project with the machine learning at the net. So check that out if you're curious. I think it'd be a great event. So uh, today we're going to talk about MLOps. You know, um, of course, MLOps is like DevOps plus ML. It's pretty simple. It's actually a thing. Uh, like anything in the industry right now, if you can put ops behind uh, the word there, like DevSecOps or SecOps or AI ops or CD for ML ops, all those kind of things, you probably make more money, or at least that's the perception right now. And when I started hearing about ML ops, I was like, okay, well, is this something that we really need? Uh, what is the difference between this and like data ops, for example, that was emerging at the same time? And I was a bit skeptical. Uh, but it's actually been a really, really cool field that is slowly emerging and, you know, taking its own plates side by side by dev, uh, data ops and DevOps and other of those uh, kind of combinations. So we're going to look at that uh, more today. If you're curious to follow up on some of these things afterwards, uh, there are tons of great articles out there, especially a lot of them are from Google and their research department. But uh, the three ones, the three resources I would suggest uh, first and most is uh, Martin Fowler's article uh, named CD for ML, which stands for Continuous Delivery for Machine Learning. Uh, he and ThoughtWorks have put together um, some really good thoughts and experiments in this area. So definitely check him out. Um, Google did a good one on uh, hidden technical depth in machine learning systems that I recommend. And then, of course, Microsoft has a lot of content on this uh, area as well. So, so what we're going to do is to look at um, machine learning from a higher perspective first to understand why we need something like MLOps to kind of manage the life cycle. Uh, because I think it's important to understand as well, like how uh, are machine learning models built in today's world? What are some steps that we take to do that? 
and what are some common kind of uh, operations uh, if you will that data scientists today do and how what are some issues with that and how can we support that with a more of an automated process uh, in this sense so we're going to take uh, uh, the shoes of uh, commander data here which are now our data scientists i know very very creative uh, and we're going to follow him through building a machine learning model and see what steps he takes so generally, when you build a machine learning model, and it's completely okay if you come from a background like as a developer, like I am myself, and don't build machine learning models day to day here, um, usually the steps then are, uh, in some sense, data preparation, model training, model evaluation, and eventually deployment to some kind of environment where we can use the model for inference of any kind of result. Each of these steps are more detailed, of course, and if you look at someone like Commander Data, our data scientist, what he would first do in terms of data preparation is that he would probably try to find the data somewhere that he needs to use to train his machine learning model on, right? And just as a general com uh, company or firm, he may find that data on a shared drive, shared network drive somewhere in his company. Maybe it's salary data of the employees and he wants to predict salary growth over years, right? So that could be like a shared uh, CSV file that just happens to be somewhere. Some people may change that over time. There's no tracking or, of those changes. Um, they may be used for multiple models. Uh, our data scientist here, he may actually know some special configurations. So he may build his own columns and uh, data points from existing columns and data points, but he may not track those changes anywhere or actually document it. But regardless, he finds this, uh, this data on a shared drive, and he may also use some data from the web, uh, for example, from uh, Kaggle or uh, AWS Open Data um, to kind of build this model here. But again, he doesn't document any of these. He just kind of fetches the data and says, this is my data set and has no idea of how it's changed over time. <laughs> we have someone not on mute. Imagine winning $1,000 a day for life. There we go. All right, thank you. Uh, so after uh, doing the data preparation here, uh, he may move on to the model training. And when it comes to model training, right, it's all about choosing the algorithms. So we can maybe use a lo uh, logistic regression algorithm here or something like a um, decision tree. It doesn't really matter, but he picks an algorithm to train a model on. And for the specific algorithm, he may fine tune it with hyperparameters which is nothing else than just parameters passed into a method um, that have to change to figure out which one is the best uh, for his specific use case. When he wants to train a model, uh, let's say it's a deep learning model where he uh, tries to um, do um, uh, image detection, um, detecting uh, a person in the image, right? He may just copy over his binaries to a cluster, a GPU cluster running in the cloud somewhere. So he just may manually copy them over and have no change tracking on that actual operation. And then just train the model. Once that's done, he wants to evaluate how good the model is. Because if the model is really bad, it doesn't really matter anymore and we can just kind of throw it away. So he may run some uh, test data on that. Um, he may have put test data aside that the model has not seen yet. And he may use that test data to understand if it's a super accurate model or if it's a really poor model. But again, that test data most likely is in a shared drive, can be manipulated by other people, and uh, there's no history of it. Furthermore, the performance he gets out, let's say accuracy or something like that, he may not actually note that down anywhere. He may just say, this model is good. It's 95% accurate. I'm okay with it. I'm going to keep going. But he may not put that information down somewhere. Or if he does, he may just put in a Word document for documentation later, but not in a place that can be automated. And when he's happy with his model, he may just end up throwing it out there to the uh, operations team and the software development team and say, this is my model, can you please deploy it to production now? And uh, you'll take it from there. So what do we notice with this? Well, quite a few things, right? First of all, every step is manual. And it's very difficult to repeat because everything is mostly on his local machine and very few things are checked into source control or tracked automatically in a database for metadata. Uh, it's just very siloed, um, especially in terms of model training. 
there is just like we see in earlier days for software engineering, there's a dis disconnect between software engineering, in this case, machine learning training and operations. We just uh, trade our model and we're focused so much on, how, on tuning the performance of the model that we don't focus at all on how we're going to deploy it. And usually this deployment scenario is really important because especially in .NET, there's so many ways you can deploy a model on. And you need dependencies, and you need to understand the performance and requirements from legal and everything else. So having that disconnect is really dangerous. And that's something we'll see, uh, we've seen a lot actually in real life. And uh, the, one of the most important things that I really want to kind of hammer in here is that if you don't have MLOps, what we don't have then is auditability. So taking this one model in production and tracking that model back all the way to the code that we used to train it and tracking it all the way back to the data that we base the model on is impossible without proper MLOps. So if you deploy a model for like a federal client, for example, they may want to see, okay, well, this model is now performing really poorly and we're going to sue you. Can you tell us how uh, you train this model on and was the data biased, not biased and so forth? So it's very important that we have auditability and that audit trail for anything we create. And that's something we can do with MLOps. So you may have noticed I, I kind of uh, hinted here on maturity level zero, and that's usually uh, the level that a lot of people start on when they start, start experimenting with ML uh, and machine learning building here. But Google has defined a couple of more maturity levels, um, one and two, namely. And we're going to look at in this presentation on how we can kind of transcend this uh, scale here more towards a more automated fashion uh, of maturity level two. And uh, in today's world, a lot of um, companies fail putting their machine learning models into production. A lot of companies today, they try to build uh, ML capabilities into their apps, but a lot of them can't get them to production just because uh, they can't figure some of these things out. And that usually leads me to say that building prototypes is very easy, but deploying it repeatedly to production is very hard. And it's a lot harder than deploying software applications to production, which we'll see shortly. So if you zoom out of this whole bubble and we look at what uh, building a machine learning system really is about, we quickly come to realize that building a machine learning model and training the model is a very small portion of the overall schema. The black box here in the middle kind of uh, is supposed to represent the, the training portion really of this, uh, this step here. We pick the algorithm and we actually fine tune it and train it on a cluster. It's very small because we have so much else to manage here. We have to manage our data pipelines to understand where our data comes from. We have to manage our configuration for our GPU clusters. We have to make sure we do uh, testing of our data and make sure we check any changes there. How do you serve infrastructure? Usually infrastructure is much more complicated to serve for um, machine learning models than for a software application because it's a lot more variable. So we have to probably throw in some Kubernetes here and cluster management of some sort. Uh, we'll see later as well that a machine learning model in production is going to decay over time. You can't just keep it in production, it's going to decay and its performance is going to get worse and worse if you don't retrain it. So how do we monitor that and make sure that we notice that in time before it's too late? So overall, we have to have a better process of managing machine learning models in production today uh, than we currently have. And taking the leap from uh, prototyping models to actually put them into production and having hundreds of models in production at the same time it's a really big undertaking, a big step. And that's what MLOps is trying to achieve here. So MLOps is trying to get that uh, model reproducibility and versioning in place. And with that, what we're trying to say here is that we should be able to retrain a model with the same data and the same uh, conditions without any issues whatsoever on a shared server, just like we do with CI and CD today in software engineering. And we need a way of versioning our models. So if we have a model in production, we need to be able to understand what that version is and then increase the version if we deploy a new one. So we can keep track of that auditability. And we need to have this audit trail and we need to understand how model thinks. So we need to have the fairness and bias and explainability pieces built into our pipeline to, uh, to achieve that. Moving down to the remaining portion as well, we need to be able to package and deploy a model reliably to production. 
And again, that can be in many, many ways. It could be a, a cluster deployment through a container, but it can also be, uh, be through uh, embedding the model into your uh, application, whether that is in Python or in .NET uh, Core. And then finally, a really important piece here is that we need a solid foundation for monitoring our performance of our model in production to make sure we understand when it decays and how we handle that decay uh, over time. All right, so a lot of speaking there, but so how do we get there? Uh, what is our end goal here? Well, to understand that, let's look at the difference between MLOps and DevOps uh, from um, like a higher perspective here. So uh, one of the differences in my view at least is team skills. Uh, a team that develops machine learning models in general is uh, uh, mo mostly consisting more of uh, you know, data engineers and data scientists, uh, machine learning engineers, uh, which are super smart, fantastic people, but they may not have as much experience with software deployments and DevOps uh, and those practices. So it's something we need to bridge in some way as well and to kind of um, um, just uh, support. Um, development of machine learning models is much more experimental than software engineering. We, there's many more times you have to go back in a loop and cycle uh, back to understand how things work and how they don't work. For example, if you want to build a classifier to classify spam and not spam, we, from the start, will not know exactly which algorithm to use and how the data is going to look like. That's going to be experimental. We just need, we know the start and we know the end, but we don't know how to get there. Uh, as you may do for like, you know, building a UI, for example, in Blazor, we say, I want four buttons on the left side, and this one should do that, that one should do that. It's pretty easy to like structure up in tickets, but when it comes to machine learning, we kind of don't really know how to get there. We just need to know where we want to go. So a lot more um, agile in that sense. Testing, you know, um, testing a software application, pretty straightforward. We've done it for decades. We write unit tests. They run the same way every time. We write integration tests. They run, run the same way every time, as long as the data doesn't change, right? Uh, and so forth. But how do you test a model's performance? And how do you test data uh, to make sure the data is coherent and uh, haven't changed? Uh, we have to think about these things from a higher perspective as well. And making sure we put tests in for fairness and bias and contract testing once you deploy the model to an API. And so there's many more facets here uh, than for a software application. Deployment again is a lot more complicated um, than it would be for software applications. Um, and again, monitoring production is something that is very different because we still have to do the deployment monitoring or production monitoring for an application, you know, like exceptions and logging that may occur or something like that. But we also need to uh, start monitoring input and output to the model and the data drift that it produces. So can we just build a CI CD pipeline though and just figure this out? Yeah, we could, but I just put that in there for make sure everyone's awake uh, and don't fall asleep. No, um, joke aside though, uh, we could for sure, but there's a, a lot of axes of change or axes of evil, as I want to call them here as well, that we have to think about and understand before we do that for MLOps. If we, again, take the analogy for a software application, when uh, we do a DevOps pipeline for CI, CD, what we really focus on then is making sure we track changes to the code. Anytime someone checks anything into GitHub or TF a TFS repo, right? We trigger a CI pipeline, and then maybe that does a CD uh, deployment, and you know, so forth, we have gateways along the way until we get to production. But we only have the code to worry about because the code is the only thing that changes. Uh, generally, of course, the environments can change as well, but we can keep track of that through um, uh, configuration as code uh, and so forth. So there's ways around that. So in general, it's mostly the code that changes. For a machine learning model, the code can also change for the application it consumes the model. It can change for the code that builds and trains the model, right? So the training scripts, but the data can change. So if the data changes, our model will change. Uh, and the model will also change if we try new experimental approaches or something else here. So we have three dimensions of change here, as opposed to one dimension for software applications. And if you dive into each of these specific uh, topics here, uh, we can look at the data first. 
So how can data change and uh, how would that necessarily trigger um, some kind of uh, CI CD pipeline? Well, for example, the schema can change here. So we can have new or removed features as part of the schema. Um, for example, change the data types is a good one. We may, for example, say that uh, uh, we have year as a string for some reason in the beginning, but suddenly it's, it becomes an integer again that's supposed to be from the beginning. A change like that can break the whole pipeline. So how do we make sure we track that change, right? Distribution and cardinality is very important as well. So for example, we may say that um, uh, we have a column for um, um, your car, for example, we track your car model. So maybe you have a Honda or an Audi or a, a Mazda, right? And suddenly there's a new car maker out there and he produces a new car. Um, let's say it's called a Washington, right? Because I live in DC. Suddenly that distribution changed the column and that's going to skew the model and it's going to make things very difficult for us. So we have to track that as well. And similarly as well, distribution is important in cases like building a fraud classifier. Um, when you build a fraud classifier, an issue you usually come across is that majority of your cases are non-fraudulent because it's very difficult to, to like get the data about fraudulent transactions. So you may have like only 1% being fraudulent. So if you work your way up to more equilibrium here of, um, of, the, of the data classes, uh, you definitely don't want to go back to being very skewed. So you need to make sure you track that because that will definitely affect uh, how good of a model you create. Sampling again is very important as well. Uh, if you, uh, for some models at least, uh, let's say you track data and weather and previously it's been very expensive to do so. So you catch the, you, you caught and recorded the temperature once a day because that's kind of what your database could hold 20 years ago. But now, you know, data is cheap. So we'll track it every two minutes. So how does that sampling frequency change uh, affect our model's performance? It depends on what you do, but that's definitely something that you will probably need to retrain your model on if that changes. So going back to the code here, um, the code can change as well. We can have um, a different business need that may affect uh, uh, our model. We may have bug fixes uh, in, during training that we need to fix. For example, uh, again, if we change the, the age column, uh, the data type from a string to an integer, that's gonna mess up our transformations. So we may have to fix that. If we remove something, that's gonna also change our transformations. Um, and just in general, if we have something wrong with our code there, we may have to fix something. Configuration, also important. How do we configure our GPU clusters? How do we configure our images and so forth? Um, and our location data sources. So a lot of things can change with the code, just like we can do with a software application. And any of those changes needs to be tracked and we need to be able to uh, retrain it based on that. The final piece here is the model, right? And I mentioned earlier, it's very experimental. So as soon as we start changing the algorithm that we train a model on, that has to be changed. If you change our hyperparameters, for example, number of um, epochs for uh, training a deep learning model, we also have to retrain our model. And uh, uh, an important aspect I think is often overlooked is that if our dependencies changes, we also need to retrain our model. And this is much more important than for a software application because our dependencies um, are usually under the surface are doing heavy math. So for example, we may use uh, you know, TensorFlow or PyTorch or Scikit-Learn for our machine learning training or ML.net in the net, right? And they may have had a bug in their previous application for you know, training or, or uh, adjusting a gradient. And that ripple effect is gonna to come to us as well. And we will have to retrain to make sure that we don't have that bug as well in our code base. Um, so that's something that's just very important to think about that when you track our dependencies, we have to be very rigorous with that. And if they change, we, will, we can assume that our model is gonna change as well with that change. All right. So moving on to testing a bit here, because um, I want to touch a bit about the test aspects uh, when it comes to MLOps and what the difference is here. So we, if we have a deterministic system like a software application, testing is simple. But if we look at a non-deterministic system, it gets a lot more complicated. And um, to make this a bit interesting, I'm going to put up this triangle here uh, to highlight those changes and we'll kind of boil down to what they are really. And I think as a software engineer, you definitely recognize this triangle from you know, undergrad, grad school, or just working in general, especially the top here. 
where we have a lot of heavy manual testing on top. And then as we go along further down the, the, the triangle, the majority of our tests is going to be unit tests or low level integration tests, right? Pretty uh, standard stuff when it comes to that. But this triangle here is split into multiple triangles within the triangle because we have to think about more than just the software application that consumes it. To the left bottom here, we have the data testing that we need to do. We have to test our data pipelines, making sure that we have valid data. So if we train, for example, a car uh, price predictor that predicts prices of cars based on age of them and the state and so forth, the mileage, right? We have to make sure that our data that we train the model on is fair. So we need to make sure that we don't, we don't have any negative prices. We don't have any negative mileage values. We don't have any strange years. So all this kind of dirty data that we can have, we need to track that and capture that in some kind of test. And furthermore here, if we move more to the right here, we have to check our transformations, making sure that we do one hop encoding for some of our uh, uh, simple columns, or maybe we want to do some kind of featureization of text for others and so forth. And we also make sure that that's tested and fully vetted. And then when we move up the pipeline here, we have these things to consider as well for like model performance and bias. You know, model performance depends on how you use the model, but let's say you do like a real time data feed and you predict uh, faces uh, in, a, in a stream of uh, photos, a video, right? From a security camera. If your model is so slow at predicting a person's face, uh, that it takes a couple of seconds, then that's probably pretty useless in a real-time video scenario because um, you know that bounding box that it was supposed to put in that video is going to be completely off uh, uh, based on where the person actually is. So we have to test the model performance in many scenarios and making sure that it's actually accurate and, and useful for us. And at the same time, we have to make sure our model is, is not biased and is fair to the output here. So uh, the final piece here, uh, before we go into more the net related things, uh, is production monitoring. So um, what do we mean with monitoring a model in production? Why can't we put a model in production and forget about it and hope for the best? You know, Because it would be very simple if you just train a model and put it in production and 20 years later, it still does you know, as good as it did when we train it. Well. If you think about it a bit here, um, something we're seeing right now on the west coast of the US, right, is tons of forest fires. And we have a climate change that is, that is actually happening uh, in front of our eyes. And what does that do um, to a data that we collect? Well, we're having this slow, slow, slow uh, heating up in the world. So everything's getting a bit warmer, which means that uh, the, the, the weather data that we captured 100 years ago is very different than the weather data we capture now. So if you use the weather data 100 years ago to you know, train a model to predict the weather tomorrow, that prediction is gonna be most likely very out of, out of whack and not actually accurate. If instead you use the data from the last 10 years here and uh, uh, train a model to predict tomorrow's data because we have a data drift. So the real world around us changes and the model that is um, that you can trained on a previous um, conditions is no longer valid. So we have to make sure that we have a solid foundation to um, track any changes to our predictions and our understanding when our model is actually becoming obsolete. And that, how quick a model is obsolete depends really on what you're trying to predict and how quickly uh, the surrounding environment changes for you. So in general, this, we call um, this data drift and we put it into a couple of buckets structural, semantic, and infrastructure drift. And if you're curious about what each of those are, uh, I used to recommend reading some of the references that I put in the beginning. Uh, there are some really good articles about this. Uh, but we need to also monitor model input outputs, right? So model input here, we have to make sure that um, if we're creating a product recommender, for example, that uh, um, we actually uh, recommend the products that are make sense. So if we introduce a new product uh, into a product group that the model is not aware of, we have to make sure we, we train the model so it understands this model and can also recommend it. Because it doesn't know about it, it can't recommend it. Um, and also we have to make sure that our model continues to be fair and unbiased in its assessment of uh, predictions here. 
All right, so uh, switching over a bit from uh, uh, specific like theory around MLOps, uh, we're going to look at more about MLOps tools now. Because I think as you may have seen throughout the presentation here, MLOps is a very, very large topic and you don't need all of it always. Uh, honestly, it's going to be too much investment to put everything into place directly. But there are some really awesome tools out there to support a lot of these things here. And in general, what, they, what we need for them to be successful is uh, discoverable and accessible data. We need some kind of tracking of the life cycle. So like tracking the data, tracking the run metrics and tracking the output results. We need some kind of version control to uh, uh, put our code that we use to train a model on. So we can use GitHub for that, for example. Um, we also need a model repository. So uh, anytime we re register a new model to go to production, we need somewhere to put it. And we can't really put it in GitHub because these models are pretty big. They're a couple hundred megs usually, uh, or more, or some of smaller as well. And we need uh, a, a better place to put these kind of large objects than GitHub can, uh, can do for us. We also need, of course, continuous uh, integration and continuous training and delivery, as we would do any other project. But uh, one of the most important things is yeah, infrastructure for running multiple experiments. And uh, the reason why I say that is because you may try to train a model with different types of hyperparameters and you want to do it in parallel. So you may say that I have these 10 algorithms and I want to test all of them and I want to figure out which one's the best. Um, and each training time can take like a day because it's a lot of data. So what you may do here is you have, you know, 10 branches in GitHub and each of these feature branch, you then kind of uh, uh, trigger a, a CI pipeline for that deploys to do a, CP, a GPU cluster and runs it for you. So we need that kind of infrastructure to support that. And obviously this uh, is usually done in, in the cloud environments where we can spin up and spin down resources a lot faster. Usually uh, we, we kind of group these things into three categories, which is tracking, model registry, and model, model monitoring. And those are things you will hear a lot when you look at this uh, area. Some of the tools on the market right now that uh, if you ever want to do this in your own organization uh, are these kind of uh, uh, tools on this slide here. There are quite a few more, but these are the most kind of popular ones. And I would say the most popular one is ML Flow right now, which is created by, uh, by Databricks and it's open source. And uh, you will have this uh, ML Flow Databricks implementation in any cloud provider. For example, you can have it in Azure using Azure Databricks it will have MLflow um, kind of instantiated for you in its own workspace. So you can use it there if you want to. But it's a great tool for uh, just managing the lifecycle in general, registering models and doing everything for you. Azure Machine Learning is also a great tool for this. And uh, it's actually, uh, Azure Machine Learning is not so much about training a machine learning model, I think, as it is being a, a, a managed MLOps service. Because it will track your experiments and your run for you. It will you know, uh, kind of create a wrapper around Kubernetes clusters so you can deploy your model into them if you wanted to. And it will create that data drift check as well for you in production. So it does a lot of really cool stuff here. Uh, and I highly recommend you have a look at that. And it nicely integrates with like Azure DevOps through um, an API there. So you can use both together if you want to have that training pipeline as well. The only downside to kind of both MLflow and, and Azure ML, to me at least, is that they both uh, kind of only support the Python and R ecosystem. And uh, I am more from like a .NET background, so I would love to see more support uh, for .NET in those. And of course, you can do the same thing in SageMaker, which is the Azure equivalent, or sorry, AWS equivalent of machine learning. Uh, and one other thing, if you work a lot with Kubernetes, uh, Kubeflow uh, is also a great tool to, to check out. And the most important one, of course, and the best one is, is MLOps.net, which is the one I've been creating since May together with uh, about 10 other people around the world. Um, it's specifically focused on .NET, uh, on ML.NET. And uh, um, we are still developing this heavily, but if you are doing machine learning in .NET, you should definitely check it out. And I wanted to give you introduction to it um, as well to kind of understand when we can use it and uh, uh, why it's created from the beginning. So it's, it's up on GitHub, and there's also a couple of NuGet packages that you can use uh, to download it. 
But the story behind this really is that, um, you know, back in early 2020, um, I was starting to look at more serious models for ML.net. And I wanted to put my machine learning models in production, but I was struggling with getting that auditability and automatic uh, pipelines that I'm so used to in software development. And I was looking around for an alternative and I quickly discovered ML Flow, uh, which was a great tool in many, many ways, but it didn't support uh, non-Python models in many ways. And it didn't support deployment, especially of these models. So I couldn't register my model in the model re registry. I couldn't deploy it to cluster through that tool. The only thing I could do was tracking the metrics, which was good, but it was only like 30% there and not enough for me. So I started uh, together with a couple of other people uh, developing this tool that will fit like a glove uh, in ML.net instead. And uh, uh, what it kind of is, does is designed on the same concepts, but you can then track your uh, um, metrics and deploy it uh, in uh, a way that makes sense for C Sharp or .NET. So the current support here is experiment tracking and metrics and hyperparameters. So we, instead of like manually tracking all these things, you can actually pass in the objects that holds a lot of these things directly. And the library will then kind of track it for you. And we are very beneficial because we live in the, the net ecosystem in many ways. So we are typed and we have an app domain and we can use reflection to fetch a lot of these things that is a bit more difficult to do in Python, for example. So uh, we can make a lot of these experiences much more seamlessly uh, and a little, little bit less verbose than it may have been in the Python uh, APIs themselves. But currently we support data tracking as well. So you can check your know, distributions, uh, see if the data has changed over time and see how, what schema you have when you train your model. So you can actually like get an idea of how many columns do I have, what were they called, uh, what kind of values do my columns have and so forth. And one of the latest additions is deployment. So in ML.net, uh, for those who haven't tried it out yet, uh, you can deploy a model in many ways. You can embed it into your c -sharp application and just call it from a method like, you know, uh, an ASP.NET Core application. But you can also put your actual model on like a blob storage in Azure, and you can just kind of read it from there from your ASP.NET Core application. And that's called URI deployment. Or you can also deploy it to a cluster in a container. It's kind of your choosing. But we currently support version models in a model repository. And the model repository can be either S3 bucket in AWS, it could be a local file share, or it could be a blob storage container in Azure. Uh, we support uh, the metadata, like metric and such, in uh, Cosmos DB, SQL Server, or SQLite. Um, so we have pretty broad support, I think, on, on terms of what your firm or you, you personally want to use. But currently, we can deploy things to URI uh, and make that in a very tracked uh, and nice fashion. But we're what we're working on right now is making it much more uh, automated uh, and kind of going into the world of Kubernetes. So what we want to do right now is we want to take that uh, machine learning model you train, and we want to build a Docker image around it with all the dependencies you use to train your model on by reading the app domain. We want to uh, automatically code generate the uh, model input and outputs for your API by just uh, decompiling your runtime instance that you pass in. And then we want to kind of build that in an image. We want to push that to your uh, registry of your choosing. We want to automate the deployment to Kubernetes, uh, either on premise or, or you know, in the cloud and make it very seamlessly. And that's what we're currently working on, on for the one, two release. Uh, once that's done, we're then gonna move on and look at uh, kind of um, beefing out the whole uh, library and eventually kind of building on top uh, uh, of this, we're gonna build a, a Blazor client running a container. So you can kind of manage and see a lot of these things for yourself. So I hope you have a chance to check it out. Again, the, the repo address here is, uh, is mlops.net uh, under my GitHub repo. We would love your contributions. We would love your feedback uh, and uh, just your thoughts. So check it out. And uh, to give you an idea, um, these are the end of the slides, by the way, to give you an idea that can be used, I wanted to do two things here to kind of further solidify kind of the MLOP experience for you real quickly. The first thing I want to do is I want to showcase how we build a machine learning model in ML.net. I'm not going to build a full one, uh, but I want to show you how the code will look like. And I want to show you how we can wrap something like MLOps.net uh, around that to track your life cycle as you train your model. And the way 
we've done this is um, currently here, we have something, um, let's see, new uh, something that was missing for a long time in the community was .NET new templates for ML.NET. So we couldn't really uh, start from scratch uh, with an ML.NET new template here. So we did those creating a couple of templates here that you can use and you can download today. Uh, and they will kind of get you started and set from a good start here. And we can run this command here from NuGet and install these uh, new templates locally here uh, in just a couple of minutes here. And what we end up having here is the general templates, right? That we always have for WPF and uh, Razor and Blazor and whatever. Uh, but we also have these new ones right here. So we have three new templates here, two for training and one for deploying your machine learning model into. And the one that we can try here is this one right here, MLNet training dash MLOps. So if you go into a, a directory here, let's see if I can not do that. One second here. Okay. We can say um, .NET new, uh, and then we can pass in this uh, MLNet training, training MLOps. And what we'll do is it will create uh, a product here to start off for training a machine learning model in C sharp, wrapped around mlops.net. So we currently have that uh, solution created here, right? Uh, based on that template. And if you open up something like uh, Visual Studio Code here, we can look at what it's done and what it's created for us. And if you look at the program file here, we see that we have this, uh, you know, a little bit verbose, but we have this pipeline created for us. And I realized that most likely, uh, people on the call today uh, may not have tried ML.net yet. So I'm not going to uh, go into that too much in detail, but what's happening here is that we are, let me zoom out one actually. We're loading our data from a text file. So a CSV file here, this is how we train a model in.net. And based on that um, uh, data, we then split the data in a training and test sets. We go ahead and choose our algorithm. So we choose uh, how we would train a model on we evaluate the performance and then we go ahead and save it to a file. So anything with the ML context here, like I'm currently highlighting, is ML.net. But then what we're doing as well is that we're creating this MLOps context right here, where we're using SQLite backing storage and we are saving our models to a local file repository. But you can, you can configure this as you please. So you can do this in a Cosmos DB and uh, uh, store your data into a S3 bucket if you wanted to. That's up to you and there's many cho choices here. But for each time we run this, each time we run F5 here, we actually create a run based on experiment name here. So we have one unique name for like the model in itself. And then each time you train it, we have a new run. And each run is going to have metrics tied to it. It's going to have a model tied to it. It's going to have um, these kind of specific things tied to it. And we can see here that if we look at the MLOps context here, we can do things like logging the data. So we can pass in the data we loaded from CSV file and MLOps.net will look at the data and just, okay, these are my columns and this is how the columns look like. And I'll save that in my Cosmos DB or whatever for later use. And we can log the hyperparameters. So we can pass in a trainer, uh, which is the algorithm. And uh, the library will say, okay, this is a logistic regression. And these are the parameters that was used for training. So when we look at this three months later, we can actually go back and understand how do we train this model and what did we use when we train this model. And we can also do things like setting the training time and you know, eventually uploading a model to a model repository. So in this case, here's going to a local um, folder on your local machine, but you can also do it to again, S3 bucket or something else. And we can add a lot more to this pipeline as well to kind of build it out. And all of this, uh, it's hopefully documented in a good way in the repo here, uh, mlops.net here. We we're trying to show some examples of what you can do here and how you can figure this based on your needs and your environments and uh, how you can also do things like uh, deploying models here. So creating deployment targets and deploying a model to URI or to a container of your choosing. So definitely something to, to check out. So Apart from tracking the metrics and the models here, something else you need to do as well is running tests, right? So we talked about that during the presentation is that we can have data tests and we can have model tests, for example. Uh, just to give you an idea how that would look like, 
this is a solution right here that trains, um, what it does is that it trains a model to predict car prices. And we're not gonna go into the code here, but this is the code for training the model. And it uh, just does the same thing as we looked at before, more or less. But before we train a model, what we can do is we can create these n unit tests here. I think they're n units, maybe um, they're actually MS units, Mink. Um, but we, they actually just unit tests, right? And uh, we can load our data from a CSV file, which is the same data to train a model on. And we can then run these tests to validate the data. So we can verify valid mileage here. We can say that if I have you know, negative mileage, then you know, that's a bad thing. We should definitely not train a model on this data because it's corrupt. And same thing with prices. If you have you know, invalid prices, don't do this and so forth. Maybe we want to, uh, at least 10,000 rows uh, of data to train a model on. So you can create this uh, just test file here to check your data and your use case kind of will dictate what you need to do here. And the same thing here as well for model tests. We can have, uh, once you train a model, we can then go ahead and do tests on the model's performance. So we can say, you know, get me a prediction engine based on the model that I've just trained. And then if I pass in this, uh, this car right here, let's you know, pass in a 2006 Chevrolet here, um, I expect the price to go between $2,600. So this could be a sanity check of some sort. And the same way here, we can have a little newer car and make sure that our model actually uh, puts it in the right range here. Um, so this is also up to you on how accurate you want it to be. But one thing I would really want to mention here that you should do if you can, is to add tests to verify the performance of your current model you trained versus the model you have in production. So you need a mechanism to fetch the metrics of the current production model and look at the accuracy and the you know, uh, bias and fairness of that model and compare those values with the model you just trained. Because if you model you just train, if that's actually not better than production, there's no point of continuing this pipeline. You can just kind of end it here. And if you want to put all of this into a pipeline, um, you can do so in something like GitHub Actions here. And uh, I do have a pipeline right here for a specific scenario. You just look at real quick here. So we have a GitHub workflow here, and we're gonna go down to the most important thing here, which is this right here, let's zoom in a bit. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, where is it? Maybe I remove it. Um, let's see. I thought I had it here. Okay, here we go. So here we go. So what we see here is that um, what we do first here is we run the data test. So this is the data test product that I just showed you. So before we even train the model, we actually go ahead and just do .NET test here and run those tests against the data. And after that, what we do is we go ahead and run and train the model. And training the model is just uh, you know doing the same thing as always, let build. But then to let it run here, it's going to actually go ahead and, and do the F5 more or less and train the model that we want. And uh, uh, if you wanted to after this, what we could do is then pipe in that model test as well. So we can do that test again uh, on a separate uh, solution, but just with that model that we just trained and see what the performance is based on that. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, depending on what your use case is, uh, you will find something that's good for you as well. And of course, you can go to Python. The, the implementation looks different in Python for scikit-learn, but the ideas are the same here. It's the same ideas, and they're transcendent of any uh, machine learning language of your choosing. So hopefully that's helpful. All right. Well, I, I just want to thank you for kind of chiming into this talk today and listening to me. It's kind of all I wanted to, uh, to mention today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and I'm also available on Twitter or through email if you have anything uh, off this talk as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alexander. Um, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if you do. Or put it in chat if you want as well. I'll put a question as we have a small, small group here. Has anyone uh, worked with ML.NET or has anyone worked with machine learning uh, where you will see this as something you want to do? Hmm. Not yet, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jessica. Well, it's an emerging field, I think, and uh, 
um, I think one thing I like so far is that we're seeing a divergence between data ops and ML ops. They were very interconnected before, and now they are um, going on different directions, which is good. And both have a place, I think, in the community. Um, so if you want to build a machine learning model in ML.NET, Taylor, um, so ML.NET, let's see, I'll show you ML.NET here. Is, so ML.NET is under the .NET library. So ML.NET is a, as a, is a Microsoft product and uh, it's an open source thing. And you can build you know, machine learning models in C Sharp and you can use the, the model builder in Visual Studio as well. So you can automate this completely. And it's great if you're like a .NET developer and wants to do this. And if you want to do those models in .NET uh, and you want to do MLOps to track everything, then I recommend using MLOps.net for that because that's going to help you and fit you as, um, perfectly with that. You can't um, use ML.net in Azure uh, for training. But if you want to do like something uh, machine learning building in Python, for example, it's like Learn or something like that, uh, you can do that in Azure ML because Azure ML is completely in Python as well. No worries. All right, Jessica's question. Uh, sort of thinking about whether you have used F sharp for ML. I have not used F sharp uh, myself for ML, but there are a lot of people that do it out there. And I would recommend, let me go and show you, uh, Luis that I uh, organize uh, a couple of conferences with here. He um, is a big F sharp advocate and uh, uh, he, from, he works at Microsoft. And he streams uh, twice a week, I think, on Twitch. And he does a lot of things in F Sharp uh, with machine learning. So if it's something you're curious about, you can follow him on, on Twitter or you can uh, check out the streams. Um, they're really, really good. A lot of good content there. But there's definitely a lot of people out there that, that really want to do machine learning in F Sharp. And ML.NET is a .NET tool. So you can do uh, machine learning in F Sharp or C Sharp uh, with the same tool. Good question. Awesome. Does any, anyone have anything else? All right. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks again, Alexander. Uh, again, as always.